Hi, my name is Dr. Lehman, and I'm going to be narrating this video of a phaco emulsification I performed in Trujillo, Peru. It's a pretty standard type cataract down there, pretty dense nuclear cataract, probably in the 20, uh, 50 to 2070 range. Um, this case has nice dilation, and we're going to pick it up after making the paracentesis and injecting the vision blue. I've put in the viscoelastic there and it brought out the rest of the vision blue and now we have a good red reflex there and we're going to use the 2.65 millimeter keratome to construct a temporal wound. You want to make about a um, 2 to 3 millimeter tunnel there, almost like a rectangle to a square type shape and that tells you that it's long enough. Of course if an incision is too short you're going to get iris prolapse and if it's too long you're going to have distortion of the wound and poor visualization of the rest of the case. So here's the uh, beginning of the rexus. I use a pre-made cystotome and create a little slice across the anterior capsule and then make the first turn with that. I prefer using utrata forceps to using the cystotome for the whole rexus because I feel there's more control. We aim for a four to six millimeter rexus and you always kind of want to be leading it with the uh, edge of the rexus folded over as you can see there. You never want to pull outward and you always want to regrasp about two millimeters from the side of the tear. That keeps you in control and it's like leading a dog. You, you're kind of telling it where you want to go next. So we've made the rexus there. It's about five to six millimeters, a little bit eccentric perhaps, but still, still good. And now we're putting some uh, BSS in the anterior chamber to bring out the rest of the anterior capsule and we're going to do hydrodissection at this point. It's good to see kind of a fluid wave. I'm not sure we're going to see that here. But after you inject some fluid, you always have to blot and push down on the nucleus so that uh, any fluid is released so you don't blow out the capsule. There you could see some viscoelastic come out of the eye and the lens come up. That tells you you got some fluid around there. But I didn't see a fluid wave, so I keep pushing. On these dense cataracts, sometimes you don't see a fluid wave. Um, so it's always good to verify prior to continuing with the FACO that you can rotate the nucleus. Again, I can't say that enough. Uh, I would keep doing hydrodissection and then blotting down the pressure until you can confirm that you can rotate the nucleus. That's the safest way for a beginning phaco surgeon to, to handle this situation. So there I got another cannula of BSS. Well, I'm trying to turn it right here. And oh, I can turn it already. So that tells me the zonules are good. And then I can proceed with phaco. So the next thing would be to get the FACO handpiece, and I like to insert it upside down so that I don't uh, use the sharp end down by the iris or the capsule. And then once it's in the eye, I rotate it 180 degrees. So I use continuous irrigation, enter the AC, rotate 180 degrees, and then begin the divide and conquer technique by creating a central uh, groove. What you should see is being able to cut with minimal moving or distortion of the wound or of moving of the nucleus. And now people always say, how wide should that central groove be? About, about one and a half uh, to two FACO tips would be reasonable. And then of course the $10,000 question is always, uh, how deep does it need to be? Well, my, my answer to that is that about 80% is the right answer. So once you start to see some uh, horizontal uh, lines, that tells you you're getting in the right layer of the epinucleus there. So, and I think I'm pretty happy with the depth there. So I'm going to insert my second instrument and both of these go in the uh, kind of periphery there and you can see, and we're just going to gently rotate them like that so that you crack that nucleus. And then using the second instrument, like pushing on a door, we're going to rotate. The more peripherally you push, the less pressure you have to use. Just like pushing a door is easier, the farther away from the hinge that you are. And here we're making a, another uh, groove. Now the depth is, is easy now because we know what's the full thickness. So you want to go about 80% and then crack that. All right, and then you can either keep rotating. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to make all four quadrants. Same thing. After that first groove, you have a very good idea of what depth you should be at. There I could see it was almost already fractured, so it don't even have to go deep at all. And then we're going to go make the last uh, two quadrants here. And of course, you could take quadrants out as you go. I think I'm demonstrating just a classic uh, divide and conquer technique here. It's easier to do that uh, last hemi-nucleus with the other quadrants in the eye. Otherwise, it has a tendency to kind of move around on you. So now we moved over to quadrant mode. 
which is obviously more vacuum, and we're going to bring the quadrant. So this begs the question, what's the proper way to bring a quadrant up into the anterior chamber, and where should you bring it up? Well, the iris plane is always the key reference point. So you want to be outside the bag in the iris plane. Um, you saw there I removed my second instrument. Oftentimes that stabilizes the chamber more because there's no fluid eg egress from the paracentesis. And so here we're on quadrant mode, we're eating it up. You know, minimal manipulation of the phaco tip is needed, um, especially on the newer machines, the nucleus, which just bounces and dances on the tip. You don't want to be up by the endothelium and you don't want to be in the bag so that you avoid any surge or nick in the capsule. Uh, now, where do you grab? You always want to grab across from the incision. You see how I move the nucleus there? You don't want to be rotating that nucleus and trying to grab things sub-incisionally. You want to go across the eye and you go on just under the anterior capsule and grab uh, in a safe place there. You never want to grab posteriorly by the, by the tip of the pie piece. You always want to grab it by the crust, as it were. So we're bringing that uh, fragment up and we're eating it in the uh, iris plane. Uh, people talk about the different FACO techniques. You can do stop and chop, etc. And I think that uh, you'll find the one that you like and that works with your technique. After 10 years of uh, private practice, I still do the divide and conquer and uh, can also sometimes leave the final hemineucleus in place and chop it in the AC. But, you know, any way you slice it, this, the case doesn't take but, you know, maybe 8 to 10 minutes. And so that's good. So instead of going to grab the uh, piece right there, I'm going to rotate it away from me so that I can have more control and know my depth in the eye better. So now I can go grab that top of the pie crust and bring it up into the iris plane and eat. And so always on my last piece, if I haven't removed my second instrument, I would remove it at this point. And that gives a lot of stability. Modern FACO machines have very little surge, but you want to err on the side of uh, more anteriorly eating that last piece so the posterior capsule doesn't trampoline. All right, so we're done with the phaco part. There seems to be uh, somewhat of an epinucleus and, of course, cortex remaining. Uh, the INA tip I use is uh, 45 degree with a silicone tip. It makes things very gentle and very easy uh, with low risk of uh, damaging the posterior capsule. Uh, when I entered the eye there, you saw me reach under the iris. I think there was some deepening of the AC that can happen in myopic eyes, and I wanted to break up that anterior capsule iris uh, block there. And this is pretty uh, friendly cortex. It looks like it's coming to the tip easy. I'm getting all the little remnants there. There I'm doing vacuuming of the capsule and it looks clear. The posterior capsule looks clear and there doesn't seem to be any remaining cortex. So everything's going smoothly. We're going to fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic. This will be provisc. You want to put a big firm fill of the eye, especially when you're starting. You'd rather have too, too much than too, too little. Um, this is the Monarch injector and we're going to be injecting the SA60 AT lens with the wound assist. So put it in, rotate the screw on the injector and then the lens comes in nicely gently without real aggressive haptic unfolding and I use a uh, Sinsky hook here to put it in the capsular bag and then if uh, if the haptics are stuck to the optic you just free them up a little by nudging them where they want to go. Uh, it's not terribly important the orientation of the haptics but if your rexus is not 100% uh, overlapping on the optic you, you want to center it as well as you can and perhaps put the haptic in the area where there's not uh, as much uh, capsule over uh, lying the optic. All right, getting all the viscoelastic out of the eye here. And then it looks like I'm getting enough capsular overlap there. And here I'm going to even go underneath the optic to make sure all the viscoelastic's gone. This is uh, fairly easy to do with a silicone handpiece. Uh, and it looks like we have good rexus coverage there. So. I'm trying to get the lens in good position there. And then the last step, of course, is stromal hydration of the main wound and of the paracentesis and uh, any intracameral antibiotics you would inject. Um, these days I'm injecting moxifloxacin at the end of the case, but uh, there's always subconj antibiotics. You do what you can with what you have. 
and uh, just getting that lens centered a little better, trying to get as much overlap on the optic. It looks like we have 100% uh, optic coverage there. And we're just filling up the AC, touching it, make sure it's a good pressure. And uh, that would conclude the case. Well, I thought the case was over, but uh, apparently uh, the wound was leaking. So the decision was made to put in a suture. And so uh, I'm quick to do this if I can't get that wound to close with stromal hydration. And it'll just be a 10 nylon passed through the wound there with a 3-1-1 closure. And that helps to uh, have you sleep well the night after surgery. So peace of mind is worth it. Rotate the knot buried, of course. And then do the same things, recenter the lens. Um, so we want to verify that we have good pressure. And uh, now I think we're done. Thanks.